Hi. I'm here today to talk to you about art. Um, and I, I know that art can be a really hard thing for a lot of people to understand. And so I want to sympathize with you on, on that issue. And um, I want to say that <coughs> while art can be something that's really hard to understand and really hard to peel away the layers of meaning in um, a piece of art, I think when we do so, um, we can get to a meaning or a message that can change our lives. And so I wanted to start this presentation with this quote from Russell Simmons. Um, he tweeted this about a year ago, and I've, I've always kept it with me since, hoping to find a way to use it. So um, he said, art saves lives. It's that simple. Um, so my goal in life is to help communicate all of the deep-seated messages of art to the widest audience possible, because I believe that it can change and impact the lives of anyone, um, not just people like myself who um, love it and do it for a living. So <coughs> I want to start right here. And I want to start with a work that I think um, is really challenging for people. Most people see something like this and say, I don't get it. <coughs> um, you know, WTF, this looks like a pile of candy. Um, but if I told you that this pile of candy was a message of suffering and deep-seated empathy, um, you might have a little bit more time and attention for it. And so <coughs> I want to walk you through what this work is about, and hopefully we can begin to understand art together. Um, this is a uh, sculpture by Felix Gonzalez Torres. He was a conceptual artist. He did this piece in 1991 as his partner, his boyfriend, was dying of HIV. Um, <coughs> in New York City at this time, that was a highly stigmatized thing to have. Um, it was hard enough to probably be gay in the 80s in New York City, let alone have a life-threatening disease. Um, and so <coughs> Felix made this work out of suffering. And he wanted, um, you know, to have AIDS is a very lonely sort of death at that point in time. People didn't really want to be around you. They were afraid. There were a lot of misconceptions as to how it was transmitted. Um, and so, so Felix made this work because he wanted to um, show people how they can have empathy and compassion for someone who was dying of something so traumatic. So the way that he did this was he decided to take something that was a metaphor for the body of his lover, which was this pile of candy, and install it in an art gallery. So these candies are the exact weight of his lover. And the way that it works is um, people are invited into the gallery and are invited to take a piece of candy and consume it until the pile diminishes. And it's also a larger metaphor for life and death. Um, each day we kind of pick away uh, at life until we ultimately leave this planet. Um, so hopefully <coughs> I've kind of helped you understand a little bit more about the meaning of art with this work. And maybe you'll have a little bit more attention and time for things like this in, when you see them. Um, but if that wasn't good enough, um, I'll leave you with this quote. Uh, perhaps it's better to think about it this way. Art is not a thing. It is a way. So um, <coughs> one of the ways that I think we can have art operate in our life is if we stop looking at art as an object, a thing in itself, and looking at it as a beginning of a, a new way of experiencing life or a new feeling or a new idea, um, by taking the responsibility off of the object and maybe just putting it in your hands um, to unfurl the message a little bit more, um, I think we could all get more out of art. So why am I here, and how did I get here? <coughs> and how did I get on this journey to put art in front of a large audience? Well, <coughs> I wasn't born here. I was born in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, it's about 80 miles due west of New York City. And it's a small town. We didn't have an art gallery, even, or a museum. So I started to experience art at a very young age. Um, my parents were both hobbyists. And so I was lucky enough that there were a few books um, in our house. Uh, on art, and I just immediately understood art. It was intuitive for me to be able to dialogue and think about it. And um, it's worth mentioning that <laughs> I didn't have my first computer until 2001. So if books seem a little stodgy, it's because it's all I had. <laughs> um, but now it's wonderful how much art is on the internet. So with that um, sort of self-education, I knew that if I wanted to be in the art world and have a career in it, I needed to move to New York City. Cities are hubs of culture. Cities are where there's a concentration of art and art galleries. 
So I came to Pratt Institute <coughs> to do my undergrad, and I studied art history and I studied fine art. And it was a wonderful experience. Um, however, once I graduated and started to work in the art world and work in art galleries, I started to drift away from the things that I really loved about art. And I started to see that art galleries weren't really getting the message out about art. They weren't exactly the best educators. Um, and <coughs> some of the format of exhibiting arts just felt stilted, felt some, somehow too formulaic. So I kind of became bored. I mean, I know that a lot of you here have been to dozens of museums and exhibitions. Um, I've been to way too many, and they start to all just look like this. And <laughs> that just wasn't doing anything for me anymore. Lucky for me, the recession hit, <coughs> and the entire <laughs> <laughs> art world sort of blew up, and I lost my job, which forced me to make a change. Um, and, and this was kind of in my little odyssey when I feel like my boat finally came to shore. Um, I had finally landed somewhere that kind of made sense. And my friend, who knew I needed a job, called me. Um, we went to Pratt together, and he said, hey, you know, <laughs> there's this job opening at, at Molina Studio. Do you think that you would be interested in it? And I said, well, you know, tell me about it. And he said, it's a really high-end interior design and architecture firm. And I said, okay, I, you know, I need a job. I need health insurance or whatever. I'll, I'll do it. Um, and this was an experience that changed my life. Um, as soon as I got there, we were working with um, not just really high-end art like Picasso's and Candida Hoffer's, um, but we were considering the whole, the whole space. We were considering interiors, architecture. We were working with artisans of all kinds, woodworkers, gilders, uh, stoop pierre, muralists, upholsters. We fabricated everything, soup to nuts. And I had never seen this sort of detailed consideration for an entire body of work this way. Um, and it just changed my life. And <coughs> I started to think about that and how could I bring this um, back into the world, back into something that I knew a little bit better. Um, and I, this is just another one of his, uh, Juan Pablo's interior design projects. <coughs> It's a really famous Rochenko sculpture. Um, it, it's installed to me in a really interesting way. It's dead center of a room and um, you know, on a really bizarre table, just something that I wasn't used to seeing or being able to play around with. Um, so from Molyneux Studio, I had a new take on how art could be infused into life. And one of the other things that I thought was so crucial to this experience was the way that we worked was we custom everything for the client. It was a whole entire project based around the people that would be enjoying it, people that would be living with it. So we really got to know the clients, we got to know everything that they liked, and we built a universe around them. Why isn't art that way? That was my question. Um, <coughs> so I left this job, even though it was great, and I knew that I had to sort of take some of this and pull it back into the world. So <coughs> uh, Juan Pablo had this thing that he said, which was the key to his success, and I think it's the key to success in anything. Um, he said that, I try to distill what, what is expected and turn into something unexpected. And I think if any of us did that in anything that we were passionate about, we would be a total success. So leaving there, <coughs> I decided that I would go here. Um, this is a gas station. <laughs> so um, this was my first attempt to take what I had learned and manifest it into a project of my own. This gas station is on the corner of 10th Avenue and 24th Street in Chelsea. It's one of the busiest corners. Uh, you can see here that there are dozens of taxi cabs um, in and out throughout the day. People from the art world, people from all sorts of walks of life come through and use this gas station. And I thought, well, I think this is a perfect place to try to infuse art um, into the day-to-day -day dealings of life. <coughs> and so. Uh, I thought it was pretty crazy. I didn't know who would really be up for this. So I called my friend Rachel. And Rachel Saxon is a, was at the time at an NYU program in, in curatorial studies. And she knew kind of how I felt about art. And she was down. She was like, yeah, I think that we should definitely do this. So we got together 13 artists and we installed their work into this gas station. And we considered every nuance of the space. We considered putting art amongst these uh, chips. We put art above the, um, you know, the beverage coolers. 
Um, we outfitted new signs for the space. We put, we decided that the name of the show would be called Art Station because we were putting art in a gas station. So we changed some of the signage. Um, we installed sculptures next to slushy machines, next to stacks of Cheerios. Um, we installed sculptures outside in the parking lot space and um, even put art on top of the microwave. And this was a huge success. Hundreds of people came to this. It was open 24 hours a day for one week, and we left the artwork entrusted into the hands of the people that worked there. A huge risk. Um, and I think everyone learned through the process. Um, we had uh, coverage in Art in America, The Daily News, Art Critical. And my favorite was there's this gossip columnist, Josh Bayer. Um, he put it in his gossip column. And for me, that was kind of like the page six of the art world. Um, and actually today, two years later, this exact gas station um, was bought by a real estate uh, developer and a really famous gallery owner, Paul Kasman, and they turned it into a public space for art, which is there now. Um, this just went up in September. So you guys can all go down and check this out. It's called the Sheep Station. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what will be next? Um, and so <coughs> running with that, I kept on experimenting with how I could get art into the lives of people in a new way. Some of the projects that I've done in the past two years are um, I did a massive block party on 26th Street. Uh, James Cohen Gallery invited me to do this with them. And we shut down the street, and we had all the galleries stay open late. And we had an indie rock band play um, on the street inside of this gallery, and 3,000 people came. And it was written up in the New York Times. That was one way that I tried. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to support uh, artists in their fight for freedom, Pussy Riot. Um, they're trying to shake up the art world in Russia, and they're, they're really taking a lot of risks to do it. Um, so that was another way that I started to engage in art in a different way. Um, I decided also that I wanted to do something like the gas station, but kind of a little bit more nightlife-y. So I started a speakeasy. Um, this was at 11 Division Street in Chinatown. We took over a top half of a restaurant and turned it into a speakeasy. During the weekends, it functions as a wedding hall. And there were actually people that were married inside of our exhibition. <laughs> I launched a concept store in Williamsburg. Um, we in kind of did art, fashion, and books. Books are definitely a passion of mine, as they've brought me to where I am today. Um, and behind um, my friend here, Slim Dollars, who's a rapper, um, <laughs> there's a stack of books by a famous poet. He allowed us to take a curated selection of his books and install them in this concept store so everyone could learn about the influences of this poet. And this is Aaron Schrader's work um, behind that. <coughs> I've also been lucky to work with fashion designers who are experimenting and doing different things, like Nicola Formaschetti creative um, director of Lady Gaga's style. Uh, I got to work with art collectives that were trying to do things like I was, Lucy Fontaine. I used art as a platform to raise $10,000 <coughs> with some friends like Lori Zimmerman from Art Nerd to uh, help, help a woman who lost her wheelchair um, get a new wheelchair. We raised $10,000. Um, I've spearheaded efforts to curate shows in challenging ways. Uh, John Ashbery, one of our famous American living poets who has a home in Hudson, New York, wanted to exhibit his home, um, the place in which he makes all of his poetry, um, in an art gallery, because it has many meanings. But <coughs> the challenge was he didn't want to have to move all of his possessions to a gallery. So we did an experimental way of hiring a famous illustrator, Matthew Thurber, to do this Trump Loy effect on the gallery walls, and we solved the problem of how can you curate someone's home without actually bringing it to a gallery in New York City. The show is actually up right now at Loretta Howard Gallery. Um, however, what I've noticed through all these projects is having an art education is not enough um, to do the things that I want to do, to engage with the public in a new way. I can do those projects forever, but that's not getting me anywhere. Um, those are one-offs, and I need to be able to do something that's sustainable to really bring art education to a new place. Um, and I want to go back, and I want to work with art galleries, and I want to work with museums again, but I want to have a tool chest that can really take things to a new level. 
So part of the reason why I'm here is because I think that I can't do this alone. And I think that the skills that I need are kind of siloed in a lot of different disciplines. And so <coughs> some of the ways that I think we can shake up New York City and get art um, more fully integrated into the lifestyles of the people that live here are through things like this. <coughs> Interactive design, ethnographic research, system design, analyzing innovative ways to do exhibitions. Um, I think the internet and mobile technology is going to play a big part in this, and already is. I also think new approaches to curation must be <coughs> taken up. And I think that also we need to be thinking of new ways of working with living artists. Um, so knowing that I have my own shortcomings, I was lucky enough to find this program uh, here at SVA. I considered how I could go back and get some skills to further along my mission, um, but it seemed that everything was too narrow, uh, again, too siloed. I could go and I could get an MBA. I could go and I could study computer science or interactive design, but that would just leave me only one little step closer to my ultimate goal. So when I found DSI, <coughs> I found a program that would give me the entire litany of skills that I could possibly need to move on with my mission in art. And I was lucky enough to apply and be accepted and to be um, in this program now with some of the brightest people that I think I could possibly be sharing the next two years of my life with. Um, so <coughs> I want to end with that. I hope that you guys will keep up with what I'm doing over the next few years. And I think that um, together at DSI, uh, we'll take my little uh, ship to the moon. So um, <laughs> thank you.